Let me read from Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. To verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Believe room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the world. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, church, it was September 9th, 2010. I just got the look from Kayla. Y'all remember that song, that old song, going to Kansas City, Kansas City, here I come. They got some crazy little women there and I'm gonna get me one. Well, I had been in Kansas City for about eight months at that point, and I went to Kansas City and got me one of them crazy women. (laughs) Not crazy, but you know. Not only was September 9th Kayla's birthday, and not only was it the day that I asked her to be my girlfriend... But it was also the day that I experienced experienced something with our church group of friends that I hadn't experienced before. There was a group of young adults from Hope Church of the Nazarene in North Kansas City. We were a small church, about this size, maybe a little bigger, and we had a really strong young adult group. There were like 10 to 12 of us that were really getting together all the time. And it was Kayla's birthday, and uh, the young adults were at Kayla's parents' house celebrating, sitting around a bonfire. And I I remember a Rody Sanchez... Uh, one of our friends from New Hope, he announced that we were going to do a compliment shower. And everyone else seemed to know what he was talking about, but me. I had no clue. I had never heard of a compliment shower. What is this? So I just pretended like I knew what was happening, went along for the ride. And then what happened was the compliment shower was where everyone in the circle, as we were sitting around a bonfire underneath her patio, they would take turns showering someone with compliments. We would go around the circle and say what it is we like or value or appreciate, appreciate about this person. And as it was Kayla's birthday, we all took turns telling her how much we appreciated, how kind and competent, how brave and wise she is. And I could not tell you what my compliment for her that day was. I don't remember from 14 years ago. I do think I might have been quite a bit nervous to ask her to be my exclusive girlfriend But nonetheless, the compliment shower has stuck with me. I remember that moment, even if I don't remember the specific words. It was a great way for us to celebrate Kayla on a day worth celebrating her. What comes to mind as you think about celebration? What makes a celebration a celebration? I heard a word down here, party, right? What makes a celebration a celebration? Friends family, food. Amen. An event worth celebrating. There's something that needs to be worthy of celebration. I learned something this week about celebrations, church. They don't always need to be happy. I mean, I guess I knew that, I've been to many funerals that were celebrations, even if they were sad and full of grief. But I didn't know that the word celebration wasn't just about feel good and happy occasions. When we hear the word celebration, we think of parties and and streamers. 
But as I was studying for this sermon, I looked up the word and its origin. And do you know what celebration, celebrate means in its origin? It means assemble to honor. It is an assembly that has gathered to honor someone or something. That's what a celebration is. So we showered Kayla with compliments. We were celebrating her as that gathering was for the purpose of honoring her. But the word celebrate is actually a church word. You know how holiday, we talk about the holidays, that's a church word from holy days. Celebrate is a church word. It is a word that was originally utilized by the church to describe what happens in worship. Celebration was a descriptor for worship. In fact, in traditional Roman Catholic worship, do you know what the priest is called? A celebrant. Joe Sancamino was right on that one. He was ready for that. That's right. So was Desiree. That's right. He is the celebrant. The priest is the one who celebrates as he offers the Mass, as he consecrates the Eucharist, the host. He is the celebrant gathering to honor Christ. And I like that language. The one who honors Christ is a celebrant, is one who celebrates. Now, today we continue our series on restoration. We're we're picking up where we left off last week. Remember last week, we recognized that Jesus is our high priest. We looked, if you remember, at Yom Kippur, the Jewish day of atonement, and how Jesus' death, resurrection, and and ascension resemble the sacrifices for sins of Yom Kippur, of the day of of, of atonement. And like the high priests before him, Jesus offered a sacrifice that would cleanse and separate people from their sin, like the rams that were sacrificed on Yom, on Yom Kippur. But unlike the high priest, however, Jesus not only offered those sacrifices, but remember, he became that sacrifice. He sacrificed himself so that we might be cleansed and separated from sin. I don't know about you, church, but that's some good news. The high priests would enter the Holy of Holies, the place where heaven met earth, in order to mediate between God and humanity and to make intercession on behalf of the people. Jesus, our high priest, entered not the Holy of Holies, but the holiest of holies, heaven itself in his ascension, in order to be our perpetual mediator. And to make intercession for us, not once a year, but perpetually for eternity. And I don't know about you, church, but the thought that Jesus is interceding on my behalf for eternity? I mean, that's some good news. So today's message then is a response to what we talked about last week. Don't miss a week. You might get left out, okay? What does it mean for you and for me, for us, that we have Jesus as our high priest? How do we live in response to this? How does this impact our daily lives? Well, that's what we're here to discuss today. But as we talk about the sacrifice and the offering Jesus made, more often than not in theological traditions like ours, we talk about about what Jesus did as a substitute, Right? You, have you ever heard that language of Jesus is our substitute? That he paid the penalty for sin that we could not? Well, I want to say on the one hand, you better believe it. Absolutely. Jesus did accomplish that which we could not. We could not make sacrifice for sin in the way that Jesus could. On the other hand, however, when we look at what Jesus did, <clears throat> it might maybe be helpful to see his work as an invitation, not just as a substitute. Because I read from Romans 12 this morning that our spiritual act of worship is what? Can you remember Romans chapter 12, what I read a few minutes ago? What is our spiritual act of worship? To offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. 
So let me ask you, if Jesus was our substitute in his sacrifice, why does Paul say that we need to live sacrificially? To offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. You see, Jesus wasn't a substitute in a way that means that we don't live in the ways that he did. Jesus wasn't a sacrificial substitute for us in a way that said that we don't also have to live sacrificially ourselves. His sacrifice does not absolve us from living sacrificially like him. No, Jesus' sacrifice, instead of saying you all don't have to live sacrificially, Jesus' sacrifice says, no, now you can live sacrificially in a way that is holy and acceptable to God. So Jesus sacrifices himself, not so that we don't have to, but good night, wouldn't that be fun? Isn't that what we want? Well, Jesus did the thing, so I'm off the hook. Well, Jesus sacrifices himself in order that we too might live lives of sacrifice like him. He gave himself not so that we wouldn't have to, but in order that we can. And this, St. Paul says, is our spiritual act of worship, to live our lives in the way that Christ did. Not preferring yourself, but preferring others. I'm going to really briefly, if you'll let me, I'm going to go through what we read in Romans 12. I want you to hear what Paul's saying here. When we're persecuted, what is the response? Well, apparently, the Christian response to persecution is not to respond with condemnation, but with blessing. I feel like sometimes we have a persecution complex. And our response to the persecution is to cry injustice and to want to condemn and tell everyone how wrong they are. Paul says, when people persecute you, bless them. Sacrifice. When others are rejoicing, what is our response? It is not to look at them and say, wow, I wish my life was that good. What do they have that I don't? Why doesn't anything good like that ever happen to me? No. When others rejoice, what do we do? Rejoice with them. And believe it or not, rejoicing with others is a form of sacrifice. Celebrating what's happening in their life, it's not about me. When others weep, we do not say, well, it's really not that bad. Suck it up, buttercup. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No, we weep with them. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'd rather not be put out by the troubles that other people are facing. That takes my emotional energy. That takes my time. That takes my life. No, weeping with others is sacrificial. Keep going through what Paul wrote in Romans 12. Church, it's all sacrificial living. Live in harmony with one another. Sacrifice. Do not be vain, but associate with the lowly associate with the lowly. Uh, Sacrifice. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Sacrifice. Never avenge yourselves. Do you know how hard this one is, church? We have a keen sense of injustice. I don't know about you, but I want to avenge myself. Never avenge yourselves, but what if you lost that argument with your wife and you just remembered a really good point? Oh, I should have said that. Let's go back. No, never avenge yourselves. Sacrifice. If people are your enemies, feed them. If they're thirsty, quench them. I mean, come on, church. According to the New Testament, we are not absolved from the responsibility of living sacrificially. It is our spiritual act of worship. But here's the thing, and I want to make the case today that this sacrificial living, this spiritual act of worship, is actually a form of celebration. 
Because remember what the word celebrate means. It comes from this Latin word celebrare. The origin of the word is what? To assemble, to honor. So yes, to celebrate someone is to shower your future wife with compliments on her birthday around a bonfire. Yes, to celebrate is to, is to gather with a family that's mourning the loss of their beloved in honor of them. But celebration is, is at its most fundamental base meaning. It is offering honor to someone or something. What are we saying just a little bit ago? All the glory and the honor to the Son. And when we live sacrificially in the manner of Christ, I mean, what is more honoring to the Father than that? Worship is a celebration. Worship is gathering to honor God. And living sacrificially is how we live lives of worship. Not just in this place, church, but when we leave these walls and go to work and go to school and meet with our family. Worship is a celebration. I heard a really interesting analysis of couples recently. A sociologist did an analysis of couples and their posts on social media. It was really fascinating. The sociologist analyzed married couples who posted lots of lovey-dovey pictures on social media and those who didn't. Do you know what their findings were? Couples who post lots and lots and lots of lovey-dovey, feel-good, mushy-gushy posts on Facebook statistically are more likely to be less happy in their marriage. Isn't that something? It's like they have to prove to the world in order to convince themselves that they're happy in their marriage. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't post fun and happy things about your spouse, church. That doesn't mean that people who never post are always happy. But it's just kind of that couples who are happy and satisfied with their spouse, they feel less pressure to prove it. It's Shakespeare's classic line in Hamlet. Can we go back to some classic Shakespeare? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. This is a scene of a play within the play. The character player queen is being over dramatic in the scene that if her husband dies, she will never remarry. And it's over the top. It's overblown. It's overdone. And Queen Gertrude says this line, the lady doth protest too much, me thinks, as a way of saying, why do you need to be so extra about it? Why? Why do you have to, like, shove it in my face how much you love this man? It's like you're, you're kind of making me think maybe you don't love him all that much. I don't actually believe you because you're being so over the top about it. Now, this might seem like a weird image to bring into the sermon at this point. But how frequently is this type of dramatic over-expressive, over-enthusiastic. How, much is, how frequently is this what Christians believe their worship is supposed to be? Sometimes we think our act of worship is to be extra with our faith. That we have to, that we have to prove to the world around us, our co-workers, our family, our peers, that we are so Christian. Because, how, because of how enthusiastically we talk about Jesus and our faith. Now, when I was in Uganda, it was unbelievably obvious which bus drivers were Christian and which bus drivers were Muslim. I don't know about other parts of the world, but if you've been to East Africa or other, I mean, I see Elizabeth nodding maybe from West Africa as well. These buses had these decals on every visible surface area of the vehicle. And they were proclaiming to the world around them, we are a Muslim bus. Or 
That's one Christian bus driver right there. I mean, it was just over the top, exuberant. Now, maybe in that culture, it kind of makes sense. I'm not criticizing the way that another culture operates, but for this American in a foreign land, it felt a little bit extra. As if having that decal splattered all over the entirety of your vehicle is what makes you a Christian. Now, hear me out, church. We absolutely ought to be talking about our faith. We should should be highlighting the moments where God's resurrection power breaks through. Don't hear me saying we ought not to be talking about our faith. And if you have a bumper sticker on your car, thanks be to God. Let the world know you're Christian. I'm just making the point that, w- that when it becomes in excess that it feels like you're proving something to the world, it might not be about God and it might be about me. Look how Christian I am. Look how good I am. It's maybe more of a form of self-soothing. When I talk about being extra, I'm not saying we do not testify to the truth. We do. What I'm saying is that our spiritual act of worship is not to prove to the world how much of a Christian you are. Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you but to Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. Ain't no proven there. What about Amos 5? Y'all remember Amos chapter 5? I despise, I detest your festivals. These enthusiastic moments. I will not listen to the sound of your music, but let justice roll down like mighty waters, and righteousness like a never-ending stream. You see, your spiritual act of worship is less a proving and more of an embodied walking and living day in and day out. To live our lives like Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, who offered himself for you so that you might live. So then our response, our spiritual act of worship, is to live our lives in a way that others see Christ in our actions, that they experience Christ in our preference for them, and that they encounter Christ by our living sacrificially for them. Now listen, church, you don't have to prove it. Live it. Let God do the proving. Because Jesus is your high priest... You are to worship. You are to be a celebrant. We are to honor God. And as we live our lives in a God-honor way, God-honoring way that is sacrificially, guess what happens? As we live like Christ, God the Father restores his image within us. By being celebrants, worshipers, God is transforming us into his likeness, which is what Paul says in Romans 12 about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. This transformation is restoration. It is Christ-likeness. And as I mentioned earlier, I really like the Roman Catholic understanding of the priest as being a celebrant as, as he offers the mass and consecrates the bread and the wine. That's a helpful image. The priest is honoring God in that work. I would just like to add that it isn't only the priest who is a celebrant. It is not only the pastor or the officiant who is celebrating. When we gather for this thing that we do week in and week out, do y'all know who the audience is? hate to break it to you. It ain't you. And I am not alone in the act of worship on this platform. So I, I, I think there's someone else who can say it maybe a little bit better than I can. So I put a little video into the service. I have a, a really quick video of Francis Chan. <clears throat> he says, in a way, says this in a way that I think is really effective. And so let's listen to what Pastor Francis Chan says about 
worship. And then God isn't even what we're trying to please you. Church, this is not a stage. Y'all are not an audience. This is not a performance. These aren't worship leaders. These are lead worshipers whose role it is to bring us all together into praise of our God. We collectively, together, in our worship, our celebrants. We offer praise to God together. You do not watch the band or the pastor worship. If you think your job is to watch other people worship, you're missing it. And you're missing out. You join with us in mutual praise of God. Now, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but if perhaps we say, I didn't like worship today, maybe that's less a testimony about how proficient and excellent and and professional things were on the platform, and maybe it's a reflection of who we brought to worship today. I didn't like worship today. Maybe I didn't like worship today because I thought my job was to sit and be entertained. What if... When you say, I didn't really like worship today, what we're actually saying is, I didn't bring my whole self there today. I didn't actually want to offer myself as a living sacrifice with my sisters and brothers in Christ today. We are all celebrants, church. And this is why we read Hebrews 4, 14, and 16. This is why the author of Hebrews says that because Jesus is our high priest, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. Not just the priest. Whether that's the high priest in the Holy of Holies or whether that's the priest consecrating the Mass, not just the officiant. We can boldly approach the throne of grace. All of us. Our worship, if you think about it, is rather bold. What we do in this moment is kind of a bold thing we confess that happens. I mean, we get together and we say that we have an encounter with a holy God. We worship with one another and we profess to have been in the presence of the divine. I don't know that you can get more bold than that, church. Our worship is a bold act by living like Christ, not of our own strength, but because he makes a way for us, we are choosing a bold life. And we can only do this, church, because Jesus is our high priest because he gave himself up on that cross, because he became for us the cleansing and the separating of our sin. As Hebrews says, since Jesus is our high priest, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace. Catch this last part, to help in time of need. You catch that? We approach the throne of grace in boldness in order that we might be helpers. The writer of Hebrews says we aren't the recipients necessarily. We are the administrators. Sacrificial living. Church, in worship, we approach the throne of grace. In worship, we enter into God's presence. We are celebrants. May we do so boldly. 
with confidence that the one who said he would meet us here truly meets us here. And may we boldly live lives of sacrifice, preferring others, meeting their need, not avenging ourselves, feeding our enemies when they're hungry, quenching our enemies when they're thirsty. May we live lives of sacrifice, for in our worship, God is restoring His image within us. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ for us today. 